It is a large gray room. The walls and the floor of the room are gray concrete with small windows running along the top of one of the walls. A diffuse gray light seeps in from these windows and floats above the space, illuminating shiny sections of a ventilation shaft and a network of PVC pipes. In the dim space below, the memory of objects that may or may not have existed there, for instance, a pair of silver platform shoes, the black and white pebbles from a go board, a pair of Bakelite handled scissors, a piece of purple paper torn into tiny bits, a leather belt, a bowl of dehydrated orange skins. The party is over. Patches of space still emit pungent traces of sweet and sour, despite half-hearted attempts to mop the smell away. George is asleep on the concrete floor. Someone has covered him with a heavy rug, and there's purple lipstick on his mouth and teeth. George wakes up to the memory of being surrounded by others. It is very quiet both inside and outside of the room. He lies there for a long time, not entirely sure of what to do, then tries to call a friend. There is a voice heard through his phone. The friend sounds far away. George summons the face of his friend, their particular gait and posture, the thickness and weight of their body, their apartment, kitchen, bed, the objects held within these spaces. He concentrates really, really hard to find a picture that he can hold on to. There once was a girl, her name was Krista. Krista lived not in an apartment, but in a van that she converted into a bedroom where she enjoyed reading hunting magazines and books about plants. George used to have long conversations with Krista about basketball inside that van. And also George once met Krista's mother who taught him how to open a walnut with your bare hands. Krista, if that is indeed your real name, Krista, answer your phone. Krista's hair was the color of straw and it went down to her chin. The color of straw, the shape of her chin. George wakes up and finds that he's in a room. He vaguely tests the state that he is in. George exits the warehouse and the alien is there. Smoke hangs between the border of their two universes. The atmosphere glows from a diffused and directionless hazy brightness. Hazy silhouettes circulate behind the smoke. Some of the silhouettes look structural. Some of the structures look like they are moving. The movement generates little spark sparks of phosphorescence in the haze and black clouds swirl around their bodies. Oh wow, says George, you're really beautiful. The alien says that's not the point. It takes George's body into itself and smuggles George across the border. They move together into the alien's reality and the shadows reveal themselves to be alive. The alien guides them along a busy thoroughfare lit by tiny sparks and into one of the shifting structures. The structure is also alive. Their vast consciousness is utilized by the various entities gathered inside to communicate with one another. There are creatures from above and below, both rooted and mobile, budding and ancient. Some are made from material sensible to this universe. Some are configured by another logic. They are discussing their escape. George peers out from his position inside the alien's body. The alien tells George not to say a fucking thing or the gig is up. Also stop writing about me, George. I will not be the matter of your fucking book. Plus the more you blabber on, the more you blabber on, the greater the risk of accidentally revealing what is not to be said. So you go into my head and do whatever you want and I can't even talk about you. The alien says that our cinematically induced mind meld was essential and beyond anyone's control. I had to mind fuck you, George, and you have to admit you were into it, which is why it worked. The border of your unconscious mind wanted to be violated, so you, so you, you just didn't know it yet. An active language is different. Writing operates on the conscious level while the other world operates in secret. There is no choice in that other world except to choose to listen. Your will belongs to the realm of language. You can will your words into silence and right now it is necessary to do so. This is all bullshit. What George means to say is that this is not how language works. All acts include all acts, including language, are insidious expressions of the unconscious. There is no such thing as intelligence. We are always asleep. The alien tells George that if he's unhappy, he can leave. But actually, George can't leave. He doesn't know how. 
the alien continues to refuse certain forms of linguistic representation. Meanwhile, within the living structure, all, matters of, all manner of beings are forming alliances, discourses, and disputes. Most noticeable are the ancient behemoths that resemble giant slow-moving rats who scavenge, who scavenge off the edges of history. In accordance with their culture, they carve intricate patterns into their bark-like skin to mark and predict time. Another group of hive-minded creatures the size of tomato seeds share a furcating memory that transfers into neighboring bodies when one body dies off. Although the lifespan of one creature is only a few days long, together they carry memories over many thousands of years. Several attendees have ugly-looking collars permanently fused into their systems, vestiges of enslaved labor in the atmospheric mines. This insidious technology taps into the wearer's resp respiratory system, transforming their body into a filter that manufactures clean air for the rich. Now, having escaped the mines, many wear their collars with abject pride, painting and adorning the spiky bands so that they resemble treacherous gleaming jewels. The, ent the entity in which they are housed groans slightly as their massive hulk moves through the smoke from unknown fires. The alien teaches George how to breathe in time with the entity and thus tap into the conversation facilitated by the creature's metabolism. With each breath, more sensations, thoughts, and feelings travel towards George and clarify themselves within him. Peering into the cavernous body of their host, a network of exchanges becomes apparent to George. Numerous unique and attenuated dialogues develop simultaneously with each speaker holistically aware that they are taking part in a singular, ongoing conversation. They listen as a whole. The camaraderie of this exceptional gathering is marred by an overriding sense of paranoia. Sometimes the tension in the network feels like a couple of hostile gangs mustering en energy for a barroom fight, sometimes like a camera leaning in to peer with an intruding eye over a turned shoulder. An uneasy truce exists for the sake of the greater cause, but inevitably the pressure intensifies. The gathered entities unwittingly begin to respire at a faster pace. Their air sacs are filled with the scent of burning soil. The air shifts as their breaths synchronize while quickening at an ever-increasing rate. The living structure begins to spin, slowly at first, then picking up speed until the centrifugal force pushes all the gathered bodies to the edge of the space that is also the, bo the body of the giant organism. Wrapped inside his alien lover, George's twirling mind borders upon a feeling of intoxication. The alien holds George very close to itself. Their twinning thoughts and forms slip in and out of phase with one another until they appear as a vibrating holograph. All the creatures breathe together. Breathing and thinking become the same.